Hello. Welcome to today's reading. Grover's here. He's ready for the story. All righty. A little far away. All right. So today we are picking up on page 222. We just had um, one day chapter and one June chapter. Day found a boy in a train while they were trying to pretend they were attacking, they were um, fulfilling the um, assassination plot that they're planting, that they're they're saying was going to happen, their fake assassination plot. While they were going through with that, they found a boy who apparently seems to be like Eden and had or has the plague, the, the special plague with the three lined X. Um, he tried to set him free, but he wasn't able to do it because he didn't want to get caught. So that's kind of scary that there's other people like like Eden. It's not just one person. There are other kids who are lab rats. Um, and then we have June, who has been spending more time with Andon, the elector. And she is she and him seem to be gaining each other's trust. And it seems like she is really going to do everything she can to not kill him. So it seems like Day and June are on the opposite sides of things right now. So we'll see how they go. I'm just gonna move my table a little closer to me so that you can't see the book as I'm reading. Just so that you don't catch me. Okay. All right, Day, page 222 is where we're starting. Day. Me, Pascal, and the other runners spend a full half day above ground after the train job, huddled in alleys or on top of abandoned roofs, dodging the soldiers that comb the streets near the station. Not until the sun begins to set do we finally get a chance to return, one by one, to the Patriots' underground quarters. Neither Pascal nor I bring up what happened by the train. Jordan, the shy runner with the copper braids, asks me twice if I'm okay. I just shrug her off. Yeah, something's wrong. Isn't that the understatement of the year? By the time we make our way back, everyone is getting ready to leave for Piera. Some are destroying documents while others are wiping the comps clean of data. Pascal's voice is a welcome distraction. Well done, Day, he says. He's sitting at a table against the shelter's back wall. He opens the side of his jacket, where he stashed dozens of packed grenades stolen from the train. He carefully packs each one into a box stacked with empty egg crates. He gestures up at a monitor on the far right of the back wall. It's showing footage from a large city square where a group of people have crowded around something spray-painted against the side of a building. Check it out. I read what the people have painted on the wall. Day lives, I scrawled across the building at least three or four times. The onlookers are cheering. Some are even holding handmade signs with the same phrase written on them. If my thoughts weren't on Eden's whereabouts or June's cryptic signal or Tess, I'd be excited to see what I've stirred up. Thanks, I reply, maybe a little too sharply. Glad they liked our stunt. Pascal hums cheerfully under his breath, oblivious to my tone. Go see if you can help Jordan. As I make my way to the hall, I pass Tess. Baxter is walking beside her. It takes me a second to realize that he's trying to put an arm around her neck and murmur something in her ear. Tess brushes him away when she sees me. I'm about to say something to her when Baxter bumps me hard in the shoulder, hard enough to knock me back a couple steps and send my cap flying off my head. My hair tumbles down. Baxter smirks at me. The black soldier stripe still obscuring most of his face. Make some room, he snaps. Think you own this place? I clench my teeth. But De Tess's wide eyes make me hold back. He's harmless, I tell myself. Just get the hell out of my way, I reply stiffly, turning away. Beside me, I hear Baxter mutter. Behind me, I hear Baxter mutter something under his breath. It's enough to make me stop and face him again. My eyes narrow. Say that again. He grins, shoves his hands into his pockets then lifts a chin. I said, jealous that your girl's whoring around with the elector? I'm almost able to swallow that. Almost. But at the same moment, Tess breaks her silence and shoves Baxter with both hands. Hey, she says, leave him alone, all right? He's had a rough night. Baxter grunts something in irritation. Then he shoves Tess unceremonially back. You're an idiot for believing this Republic lover, little girl. My rage explodes. I've never been fond of fistfights. I always try to steer clear of them on the streets of Lake, but all the anger that's been building inside me floods my veins when I see Baxter lay his hands on Tess. I lunge forward and punch him in the jaw as hard as I can. He crashes into one of the tables and onto the ground. Instantly, the others nearby burst into whoops and hollers. 
forming a makeshift circle around the two of us. Before Baxter can get to his feet, I leap on him. My fist connects twice with his face. He lets out a snarl. Suddenly, his weight advantage takes over. He pushes me hard enough to send me flying into the side of a comp desk, then pu pulls me up, grabs my jacket, and slams me against the wall. He lifts me clear off my feet, then drops me and smashes his fist into my stomach, knocking the breath out of me. You ain't one of us. You're one of them, he hisses. Did you detour from our train mission on purpose? I feel a knee ram into my side. Well, I'm going to kill you, you dirty trot. I'm going to skin you alive. I'm too furious to feel the pain. I manage to tuck one of my legs up and kick him in the chest as hard as I can. From the corner of my eye, I notice some patriots quickly exchanging bets. An improvised skiz duel. For an instant, Baxter reminds me of Thomas. And suddenly, all I see is my old, in, is my old street and lake with Thomas pointing his gun at my mother and the soldiers dragging John away into a waiting jeep. Strapping Eden into, into that lab gurney, arresting June, hurting Tess. The edges of my vision turn scarlet. I lunge for him again and swing at his face. But Baxter's ready for me. He knocks my arm out of the way and throws his full weight against me. My back slams down hard onto the ground. Baxter grins, then grabs my neck and gets ready to shove his fist to the side of my face. Abruptly, he lets go. I suck in a deep breath as his weight leaves my chest, then clutch my head as one of my headaches erupts in full-scale agony. Somewhere above me, I can hear Tess, then Pascal shouting at Baxter to back off. Everyone's talking at once. One, two, three. I count off numbers in my head, hoping this little exercise distracts me from the pain. It used to be so much easier to ward off these headaches. Maybe Baxter had hit me in the head and I don't even know it. Are you okay? Now Tess's hands are on my arm and pulling me to my feet. I'm still dizzy with pain from my headache, but the rage has passed. Abruptly, I'm aware of the burning soreness of my side. Fine, I reply hoarsely, inspecting her face. Did he hurt you? Baxter is glaring at me from where, the pa where Pascal is trying to talk him down. Already, the others around us have returned to their business, probably disappointed that the fight didn't last longer. I wonder who they've decided the winner is. I'm okay, Tess says. She runs a hand hurriedly through her bobbed hair. Don't worry. Tess. Pascal calls out to us. See if Day needs any patching up. We're on a schedule here. Tess leads me down the hall and away from the common room. We walk into one of the bunker rooms that's been turned into a makeshift hospital, then shut the door. We're surrounded by shelves piled high with an assortment of pill bottles and boxes of bandages. A table sits in the middle of the room, leaving only a narrow space to walk around. Now I lean against that table as, as Tess rolls up her sleeves. Do you hurt anywhere? She asks. I'm fine, I repeat. But the moment I say that, I wince and clutch at my side. Okay, maybe a little banged up. Let me see, Tess says firmly. She bats my hand aside, then unbuttons my shirt. It's not like Tess t has never seen me shirtless. I've lost count of how many times she's had to patch me up. But now there's an awkwardness that hangs heavily between us. Her cheeks burn bright pink as she runs her hands across my chest, along my stomach, then presses her fingers against my sides. I inhale sharply when she touches a sensitive spot. Yeah, that's where his knee got me. Tess studies my face. Feeling nauseous? No. You shouldn't have done that, she says as she works. Say ah. I open my mouth for her. She touches a tissue to my nose, inspects both my ears, and then hurries out for a moment. She comes back with an ice pack. Here, hold this on the spot. I do what she tells me. You've become very professional. I've learned a lot from the Patriots, Tess replies. When she stops inspecting my chest long enough to face me, she holds my gaze with her own. Baxter just doesn't like your attraction to a former Republic soldier, she mutters. But don't let him get you get to you like that, okay? No point in getting yourself killed. I remember Baxter's arm around Tess's neck. My temper flares again, and suddenly I feel a need to guard Tess the way I did back on the streets. Hey, cousin, I say softly. I'm really sorry about what I said to you. About, you know. Tess's blush, blush deepens. I struggle to find the right words. You don't need me to take care of you. I say with an embarrassed laugh, then tap her a nose once. I mean, you've probably fussed over me a thousand times. I've always needed your help more than you've needed mine. Trust, Tess draws closer and lowers her eyes shyly, a gesture that helps me forget my troubles. Sometimes I forget how nice Tess's steady devotion is, a rock I could always lean on during the worst times. Even though our days in Lake were a struggle, right now they seem so much simpler. I catch myself wishing we could go back to that, sharing scraps of food and whatever else we could scrounge up. If June were here, what would have happened? She probably would have attacked Baxter herself. 
and she probably would have done a hell of a better job than I did, just like everything else. She wouldn't have needed me at all. Tessa's hand lingers on my chest, but she's not checking for bruises anymore. I become aware of how close she is. Her eyes wander back up to mine, large and liquid brown, and unlike June's, so easy to read. The image of June kissing the elector pops into my mind again, a recollection that twists my stomach like a knife. Before I can think about anything else, Tess leans forward and presses her lips against mine. My mind is blank, completely taken aback. A brief tingle runs through me. In my numbness, I let her linger. Then I wrench away. My palms break out in a cold sweat. What was that? I should have seen this coming and stopped myself right away. I put my hands on her shoulders. When I see the hurt pass through her eyes, I realize just how big of a mistake I made. I can't, Tess. Tess blows out an irritated breath. What? Are you married to June now? No, I just... My words flitter away, sad and powerless. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. At least not now. What about the fact that June is kissing the Elector? What about that? Are you really going to be so loyal to someone you don't even have? June. Always June. I hate her for a moment and wonder if everything would have been better if we'd never met. This isn't about June, I say. June is playing a role, Tess. I edge away from Tess until we're separated by a good foot. I'm not ready for this to happen between us. You're my best friend. I don't want to mislead you when I don't even know what I'm doing. Tess throws her hand up in indi indignation. You kiss random girls in the street without a second thought, but you won't even? You're not a random girl in the street, I snap. You're Tess. Her eyes flash at me, and she takes her frustration out on her lip, biting it so hard that she draws blood. I don't understand you, Day. Each word hits me with measured force. I don't understand you at all. But I'm going to try to help you anyway. Can you really not see how your precious June has changed your life? I shut my eyes and press both hands against my temples. Stop. You think you're in love with a girl you've known for less than a month? A girl who? Who's responsible for your mother's death? For John's? Echoes of what she said to me in the bunker room. Damn it, Tess. It wasn't her fault. Wasn't it? Tess spits out. Day, they shot your mother because of June. You act like you love her? I've done nothing but help you. I've been at your side ever since the day we met. You think I'm being childish? Well, I don't care. I've never said a word about the other girls you've been with, and I can't bear to watch you choose a girl who has done nothing but hurt you. Has June ever apologized to you for what happened? Has she had to work for your forgiveness? What's the matter with you? At my silence, she puts her arm on my hand, her hand on my arm. Well, do you love her? She says more quietly. Does she love you? Love her. I told her so in the Vegas bathroom, and I'd meant it. But she didn't say it back, yeah. Maybe she never felt the same way. Maybe I'm just deluding myself. I don't know, okay, I reply. My words sound angrier than I actually am. Tess is trembling. Now she nods, silently takes the ice pack from my side, and buttons my shirt back up. The chasm between us widens. I wonder if I'll ever be able to reach the other side again. You should be fine, she says in a monotone as she turns her back to me. She stops in front of the door, her back to me. Trust me, Day. I'm saying this for your sake. June will break your heart. I can see it already. She'll shatter you into a million pieces. June. Piera's Olin Court Hall. Sometime around nine, 900 hours. 29 degrees Fahrenheit outside. The day has finally arrived for Anton's assassination, and I have three hours before the Patriots make their move. The night before, I had another visit from the same guard who had once given, a message from the, given me a message from the Patriots. Good work, she whispered in my ear as I lay in bed, wide awake. Tomorrow, you'll be pardoned by the elector and his senators, and they'll release you up here as Olin Court Hall. Now listen closely. When you're all finished at the Court Hall, the elector's jeeps will escort all of you back to Pierre's main military quarters. The Patriots will be waiting along that route. The soldier paused as if to see, I, to see if I had any questions, but I just stared straight ahead. I could guess what the Patriots wanted me to do, anyway. They want me to separate Andon from his guards. Then the Patriots will drag him out of his jeep and shoot him. They'll record it, then announce it to the whole Republic using the rewired speakers and jumbotrons on Denver's Capitol Tower. When I didn't say anything, the soldier cleared her throat and went on in a hurried voice. Watch for an explosion on the road. When you hear it go off, have Andon order his convoy to take a different route. Make sure you separate the elector from his guards. 
Tell him to trust you. If you've done your job, he'll follow your lead. The soldier smiled briefly at me. Once Andon is separated from the other jeeps, leave the rest to us. I spent the rest of that night in a fitful state. Now, as I'm escorted into the main court hall building, I check the rooftops and alleys for the other buildings along the way, watching for Patriot eyes, wondering if one pair of them will be bright blue. They will be amongst the Patriots out here today. Inside my black gloves, my hands are cold with sweat. Even if he saw my signal, will he understand what I meant by it? Will he know to drop what he's doing and make a run for it? As I head toward the courtroom's grand arched entrance, I, remem I memorize street names and locations out of habit, where the main military base is, where Pierre's hospital rises in the distance. I feel like I can sense the Patriots getting into position. There's a stillness in the air. Even though the buildings here are tightly packed and the streets are narrow, both soldiers and civilians, most of them poor and assigned to tend to the troops, bustle noisily along the streets. Some of the uniformed soldiers on the street look at us a little too long. I note them carefully. There must be Patriots watching us. Even inside the hall, there, it's cold enough for my breath to cloud, and I tremble nonstop. The ceiling's at least 20 feet high, and the floors are polished synthetic, judging from the sound of boots against it. Wood. Not very conductive to retaining heat in winter. How long is this going to take? I ask one of the guards as they escort me to my seat in the front of the courtroom. My boots, warm, waterproof leather, echo harshly against the floors. I shiver in spite of the double-breasted coat I have on. The guard I spoke to gives me an uncomfortable nod. Not long, Miss Paris, she replies with practiced politeness. The elector and senators are in final deliberations, probably going to take at least another half hour. It's interesting, really, because the elector himself will be pardoning me today. The guards aren't sure exactly how to behave. Guard me like a criminal? Or kiss up like I'm a high-ranking agent in one of the capital's patrols? The waiting drags on. I feel slightly dizzy. I'd been given some medicine after finally mentioning my symptoms to Andon earlier in the day, but it hasn't helped. My head still feels warm, and I'm having trouble keeping count of the time in my head. Finally, when I've counted off 26 minutes, possibly off by three or four seconds, Andon emerges from the doors at the far end of the room with a team of officials behind him. It's clear that not everyone is happy. Some senators hang back, their mouths pulled into tight lines. I recognize Senator Camion among, among them, the man Andon had been arguing with on the train here. His graying hair looks disheveled today. Another senator I remember from occasional headlines, Senator O'Connor, a blubbery woman with limp red hair and a mouth not unlike a frog's. I don't know the others. Aside from the senators, two young journalists flank Andon's side. One has his head down, taking dictation furiously on a notepad, while the second struggles to keep his voice recorder close enough to Andon. I rise when they reach me. The senators who are bickering amongst themselves fall silent. Andon nods at my guards. Judah Paris, Congress has pardoned you of all crimes against the Republic on the condition that you will continue to serve your nation in the best of your capabilities. Do we have an understanding, Miss Paris? I nod. Even this slight movement makes me lightheaded. Yes, Elector. The scribe beside Andon frantically jots our, jots our words down. His notepad screen flickers under his flying fingers. Andon takes in my listlessness. He can tell him that my condition hasn't improved. You will enter a period of probation, as advised to me by my senators, during which time you'll be closely surveyed until we can all agree that you're ready to return to duty. You'll be assigned to the Capitol's patrols. We'll discuss which patrol you'll be joining once we're all settled in Pierre's base this afternoon. He raises his eyebrows and turns to, to his right and left. Senators, any comments? They remain silent. One of them finally, finally speaks through a thinly veiled sneer. Understand that you are not yet in the clear agent of Paris. You will be watched at all times. You should consider our decision an act of enormous mercy. Thank you, Elector, I reply, tapping my head in a brief salute as any soldier would. Thank you, Senators. Thank you for all of your help, Andon says with a subtle bow. I keep my head lowered so I don't have to meet his eyes to see the double layer of meaning in his words. He's thanking me for the help I supposedly gave in protecting him and the help he wants from both Day and me. Somewhere outside, Day is in position with the others. The thought makes me nauseous with anxiety. The soldiers begin escorting our party back to the front of the conference hall and toward our respective rides. I take each step deliberately, trying hard to maintain my focus. Now is not the moment to fail because of illness. I keep my eyes on the hall's entrance. Since our last train ride, this is the one idea I've settled on that just might work. Something to throw off all the Patriots' timing. 
Something I can do to prevent us from heading back toward Pyrrha's main military hall. I hope this works. I don't think I can afford any mistakes. With ten feet to the doors, I stumble. Instantly, I right myself again and continue walking, but then stumble again. Murmurs from the senders rise up behind me. One of them snaps. What is it? The Nandan is there, his face hovering above me. Two of his guards jump in front of him. Elector, sir, one says, please stay back. We'll take care of this. What happened? Anden asks, first to the soldiers, then to me. Are you injured? It's not too hard to pretend I'm about to faint. The world around me fades, then sharpens again. My head hurts. I raise my head and make eye contact with Anden. Then I let myself collapse to the ground. Startled exclamations buzz around me. Then my ears perk up when I hear Anden above them all say exactly what I'd hoped he would say. Take her to the hospital immediately. He remembers my last piece of advice to him, what I'd said to him on the train. But a lecture, protests the same guard who had fired me earlier. Anden takes on a steely tone. Are you questioning me, soldier? Strong hands help me back to my feet. We go through the doors and back out into the light of an overcast morning. I squint at the surroundings, still searching for suspicious faces. Are the guards holding me up, potential patriots in disguise? I cast glances at them, but their expressions are completely blank. Adrenaline is rushing through me. I've made my move. The patriots know I've deviated from the plan, but they don't know if I did it intentionally. The important thing is that the hospital is on a route opposite the one leading to the Piera base, where the patriots are ready and waiting. And it's going to follow me. The Patriots won't have time to readjust their positions. And if the other Patriots hear about this, so should they. I close my eyes and hope that he can follow through. I try sending a silent message to him. Run away. When you hear that I've deviated from the plan, run away as fast as you can. A guard hoists me up in the back seat of one of the, the waiting Jeeps. Anden and his soldiers get into the Jeep in front of us. The Senators, bewildered and, and indignant, go to their regular cars. I have to force a smile off my face as I sit limply in the seat peering out the windows. The jeep roars to life and pulls forward. Through the windshield, I see Andon's jeep leading us away from the conference hall. Then, just as I, I'm congratulating myself for such a stellar plan, I realize that our jeeps are still headed for the base. They're not going toward the hospital at all. My momentary joy vanishes. Fear replaces it. One of my guards notices too. Hey, chauffeur, he snaps at the soldier who's driving. Wrong way. Hospitals on the left side of town, he sighs. Somebody get the electric driver on the mic. Where? The driver waves him off, presses one thick, gnarly hand against his ear in concentration, then glances back at us with a frown. Negative. We just got orders to stay on our original course, he replies. Commander DeSoto says the elector wants Miss Paris taken to the hospital afterward instead. I freeze. Razor must be lying to Andon's driver. I seriously doubt that Andon would have let him give the driver such an order. Razor's going ahead with the plan. He's going to force us to take the intended route in any way he can. It doesn't matter what the reason is. We're still heading straight toward the Piera base, straight into the Patriots' waiting arms. Day. The day of the Elector's assassination is finally here. It arrives like a looming hurricane of change, promising everything I'm anticipating and dreading. Anticipating the Elector's death, Dreading, June signal, or maybe it's the other way around. I still don't know what to make of it. It leaves me on edge when I should otherwise feel nothing but a rising sense of enthusiasm. I tap restlessly on the hilt of my knife. Be careful, June. It's the only certain thought running through my head. Be careful, for your sake and for ours. I'm perched precariously at the edge of a crumbling windowsill in an old shell of a building, four stories up and hidden from the street, with two grenades and a gun tucked securely at my belt. Like the rest of the Patriots, I'm dressed in a black Republic coat. So from a distance, I look like a Republic soldier. A black stripe runs across my eyes again. The only thing distinguishing us is a white band on our left instead of right arms. From here, I can see the railroad tracks that run right along a neighboring street, slicing Pierre in half. Off to my right, in a small alley three buildings down, lies the entrance to the Patriots' Pierre tunnel. Its underground bunker is empty now. I'm alone in this abandoned building although I'm pretty sure Pascal can see me from his vantage point on a roof across the street. The thud of my heart against my ribs can probably be heard for miles. I start thinking for the hundredth time about why June wants to stop the assassination. Did she uncover something the Patriots are keeping a secret from me? Or did she do what Tess had guessed she might do? Did she betray us? 
I shake the thought stubbornly, stubbornly away. June would never do that. Not after the, what the Republic did for her brother, to her brother. Maybe June wants to stop the assassination because she's falling for the Elector. I shut my eyes at the image of them kissing. It flares up in my mind. No way. Would the June I know be that sentimental? All the Patriots are in position. Runners on the roofs, poised with explosives. Hackers one building away from the tunnel entrance, ready to record and broadcast the Elector's assassination. Fighters positioned along the street below us, and soldier or civilian garb, prepared to take the Elector's guards down. Tess and a couple of medics are scattered, ready to bring the injured into the tunnel. Tess, specifically, is hiding in the narrow street bordering the left side of my building. After the assassination, we'll need to be ready to escape, and she'll be the first one I get. And then there's me. According to the plan, June's supposed to steer the Elector away from the protection of his guards. When we see his jeep speed by alone, the runners will cut off his escape routes with explosions. Then I head down to the street. After the Patriots have dragged Andon out of his car, I'm going to shoot him. It's the middle of the afternoon, but clouds keep the world around me a cold, dark, ominous gray. I check my watch. It's set on a timer for when the Elector's jeeps are expected to come whizzing around the corner. Fifteen minutes until showtime. I'm shaking. Is the Elector really going to be dead in fifteen minutes? By my hand? Is this plan really going to work? After it's all over, when are the Patriots going to help me find and rescue Eden? When I'm told, when I, I'd told Razor about seeing the boy on board the train, he'd given me a sympathetic response and said that he'd already started working to, to track Eden down. All I can do is believe him. I try to picture the Republic thrown into complete chaos, with the Elector's assassination publicly broadcast on every jumbotron in the nation. If the people are already rioting, I can only imagine how they'll react when they see me shoot the Elector. What then? Will the colonies take advantage of the situation and surge right into the Republic? breaking past the war front that's held the two sides apart for so long. A government? A new order? I shift with pent-up energy. Of course, this doesn't factor in June's signal. I try to flex my fingers. My hands are clammy with cold sweat. Hell if I know what's really going to happen today. Static buzzes in my earpiece, and I pick up a few broken words from Pascal. Orange and Echo Streets, clear. His voice sharpens. Day? I'm here. Fifteen minutes, he says. Quick review. Jordan's setting off a first explosion. When the Elector's Jeep caravan run reaches her street, she'll toss her grenade. June will separate the Elector's car from the others. I toss my grenade. Then they'll turn right down your street. You toss down yours when you see the caravan. Corner that Jeep get corner that Jeep in and then head down to the ground. Got it? Yeah, got it, I reply. Just hurry the hell up and get into your own position. Waiting here gives me a sick feeling in my stomach taking me back to that evening when I'd waited for the plague patrols to show up at my mother's door. Even that night seems better than today. My family was alive back then, and Tess and I were still on good terms. I practiced taking several deep breaths and slowly letting them back out. In less than 15 minutes, I'm going to see the Elector's caravan in June come down this street. My fingers run along the edges of the grenades in my belt. One minute passes, then another. Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Each one drags by slower than the last. My breaths quicken. What will June do? Is she right? What if she's wrong? I think I'm ready to kill the Elector. I've been talking myself into this over the last few days, even getting excited over it. Am I ready to save his life? Someone I can't think about without feeling enraged. Am I ready to have his blood on my hands? What does June know that I don't? What does she know that makes him so worth saving? Eight minutes. Then suddenly, Pascal comes back on. Stand by. We've got a delay. I tense up. Why? There's a long pause. Something's wrong with June, Pascal says in a hushed whisper. She fainted while leaving the courthouse. But don't freak out. Razor says she's fine. We're resetting the clocks for a two-minute delay. Got it? I rise a little from my crouch. She's making her move. I know this instantly. Something tingles at the back of my mind. A sixth sense warning me that whatever I'd planned to do the Elector will shift depending on what June does next. Why did she collapse? I ask. Don't know. Scout says it looks like she got dizzy or something. So she's back on track now? Sounds like we're still moving forward. Still moving forward. Was June's plan foiled? I get up, pace for a few steps, and then return to my crouch. Something's not right about this scenario. If we're going ahead with the plan, will I see her come by in the same Jeep as expected? And against her will? 
Are the Patriots going to know she tried to deviate? The bad feeling refuses to go away, no matter how hard I try to ignore it. Something's really off. Two agonizing minutes pass. In my anxiety, I've chipped away a large chunk of paint from the hilt of my knife, my thumbs covered in black flakes. Several streets away, the first grenade explodes. The ground trembles, the building shudders, and a cloud of dust raises down, rains down from the ceiling. The Elector's jeeps must have made an appearance. I leave my vantage point at the windowsill, then head into the stairwell up to the roof. I keep low, careful to stay out of sight. From here, I get a better view of where smoke is from the first explosion is rising, and I can hear the startled so shout of soldiers near it. They're about three blocks away. I flatten myself onto the broken tiles of the roof as several guards come dashing down the street. They're yelling something incomprehensible. I'm willing to bet they're bringing reinforcements over to the bombing area. Too late. By the time they get there, the electric jeep will have turned the corner that they, we wanted it to turn. I take out one of my grenades and hold it gingerly in my hand, reminding myself how it works, reminding myself that if I throw it on time, I'll be going against June's warning. It's an impact grenade, Pascal had said. Blows the second it hits. Press the strike lever, pull the pin, throw, and brace yourself. Off in the distance, another explosion rocks the streets, and an accompanying cloud rises. Baxter was in charge of that one. Now he's somewhere on ground level or over there, hiding in an alley. Two blocks away. The Elector is getting closer. A third explosion goes off. This one is much closer. The Jeep is only a block away. I steady myself as the ground shakes from the impact. My turn's coming up. June, I think. Where are you? If she makes a sudden move, what will I do? Over my earpiece, Pascal sounds urgent. Steady, he says. And then I see something that makes me forget everything I've promised to do for the Patriots. The door on the second Jeep flies open and out rolls a girl with a long, dark ponytail. She tumbles a few times and struggles to her feet. She looks up to the rooftops and waves her hands frantically in the air. It's June. She's here. And there's no doubt now that she does not want me to separate the Elector from his guards. Pascal's voice comes on again. Stay the course, he hisses. Ignore June. Stay the course. Do you hear me? I don't know what comes over me. An electric shudder runs down my spine. No. June, you can't stop now, part of me says. I want the Elector dead. I want to get Eden back. And then there's June, waving her arms in the middle of a street full of danger, risking her life to raise the alarm for me. Whatever her reason, it must be good. It must be. What do I do? Trust her, something deep inside me says. I squeeze my eyes shut and bow my head. Each second that ticks by now is a bridge between life and death. Trust her. Suddenly, I jump up and run across the roof. Pascal shouts something angry at me over the earpiece. I ignore him. As the vehicles pass me next to the building I'm on, I pull the pin from my grenade and throw it as far as I can down the block, right in front of where the Patriots want them to go. Jay, Pascal's frantic voice. No, what are you? The grenade hits the street. I cover my ears and am instantly thrown off my feet as a blast shakes the earth. The jeep screech to a halt right in front of the explosion. The electric jeep tries to swerve around the rubble, but one of its tires bursts and forces it to stop. I've completely blocked off the street they were supposed to go down, where the Patriots are waiting for the Elector, and the rest of the Elector's jeeps are still there, the entire caravan of them. Now, June's sprinting toward the Elector's vehicle. If she's trying to save him, then I have no time to waste. I hop back to my feet, swing over the side of the roof, and grab onto the gutter at the edge of the building. Then I slide down. The gutter pipe pops off the building, throwing me off balance, but I fling myself off it and grab the edge of the nearby windowsill. My feet land on the second floor's ledge. I hop down to the first floor and roll. The street's absolute chaos. Through the shouts and smoke, I can see Republic soldiers running toward the jeeps, while the uh, soldiers in the other jeeps rushing, rush out to get to the Elector. Some of the Patriots in disguise are hesitating, confused over my mistimed blast. It's too late to separate the Elector's jeep from the others now. There are simply too many soldiers. Swarms of them are coming down the street. I feel numb, in some ways as bewildered as they are still unsure of why I'm going against everything I plan to do. Tess, I shout. She's right where she's supposed to be, frozen against the shadows of a building. I reach her and grab her shoulders. What's going on? She shouts back, but I just whirl her around. Tunnel entrance, okay? Don't ask. I point her in the direction of the Patriot's bunker, where we were supposed to hide after the assassination. Tess's mouth is open in naked fear, but she does what I say, darting into the security of the building's shadows and disappearing from view. Another explosion rocks the street behind me. 
the grenade must have come from one of the other runners. Even though they won't get the Elector to their planned location, they're trying to block in the Jeeps to make an attempt. Patriots must be running around everywhere. They're literally going to kill me for what I did. Me and Tess have to reach the tunnel before they find us. I run up to June right where she, right as she reaches the Elector's Jeep. There's a man inside with dark wavy hair, and she's shouting at him as she presses her hands against his window. Another explosion goes off somewhere, forcing June to her knees. I throw myself over her as debris and rubble rain down on us from every direction. A block of cement hits my shoulder, making me shudder in pain. The Patriots are definitely trying to make up for lost time, but the delay has already cost them dearly. If they get desperate, I know they'll just forget about broadcasting an actual kill and blow up the Elector's Jeep instead. Republic soldiers are pouring into the streets. I'm sure they've seen me by now, too. I hope Tess is safe in the underground. June. She looks dazed and bewildered, but then she recognizes me. No time for greetings now. A bullet zips overhead. I duck and shield June again. One of the soldiers near us gets, a shot, gets shot in the leg. Please, for the love of... Please let Tess make it safely to the tunnel entrance. I whirl around and meet the electric's wide eyes through the window. So this is the guy who kissed June. He's tall and good-looking and rich. He's going to uphold all of his father's laws. He's the boy king who symbolizes everything the Republic is. The war with the colonies that led to Eden's illness. The laws that put my family in the slums and led to their deaths. The laws that sent me off to be executed because I'd failed some stupid gaudy test when I was 10. This guy is the Republic. I should kill him right now. But then I think of June. If June knows a reason we should protect him from the Patriots and believes it enough to risk her life and mine, then I'm going to trust her. If I refused, I'd be breaking ties with her forever. Can I live with that? The thought of that chills me to the bone. I point down the street toward the explosion and do something I never thought I'd do in my whole life. I yell as loud as I can to the soldiers. Back up the jeeps, barricade the street, protect the elector. Then, as other soldiers reach the Elector, I shout frantically at them. Get the Elector out of this car. Get him away from here. They're going to blow it up. June yanks us down as another bullet hits the ground near us. Come on, I shout. She follows me. Behind us, dozens of Republic soldiers have arrived on the scene. We catch a quick glimpse of the Elector getting out of his Jeep, then being hurried away behind the protection of his soldiers. Bullets fly. Did I just see one hit the Elector in the chest? No, just his upper arm. Then he disappears, lost behind a sea of soldiers. He's saved. He's going to make it. I can hardly breathe at the thought. I don't know if I should be happy or furious. After all that buildup, the Elector's assassination has failed because of me in June. What have I done? That's Day, someone calls out. He's alive. But I don't dare turn around again. I squeeze June's hand tighter, and we dart around the rubble and smoke. We bump into our first patriot, Baxter. He stops short for a second when he sees us, then seizes June's arm. You, he spits out. She's too quick for him, though. Before I can draw the gun at my waist, June slipped right out of his grasp. He grabs for us again, but someone else knocks him flat on his face before we can make another move. I meet Katie's burning eyes. She waves her hands furiously at us. Get to safety, she yells, before the others find you. There's a deep shock on her face. Is she stunned that the plan fell apart? Does she know we had anything to do with it? She must know. Why is she turning on the Patriots, too? Then she runs away. I let my eyes follow her for an instant. Sure enough, Andon is nowhere to be seen, and Republic soldiers have started firing back up at the roofs. Andon is nowhere to be seen, I think again. Has the assassination attempt, assassination attempt officially failed? We keep running until we're on the other side of the explosion. Suddenly, there are Patriots everywhere. Some are running toward the soldiers and looking for a way to shoot the Elector and others are fleeing for the tunnel, running after us. Another explosion shakes the street. Someone has tried in vain to stop the Elector with another grenade. Maybe they finally managed to blow up his Jeep. Where's Razor? Is he out for our blood now? I picture his calm, fatherly face alight with rage. We finally reach the narrow alley that leads to the tunnel, barely ahead of the Patriots hot on our tail. Tess is there, huddled in the shadows against the wall. I want to scream. Why didn't she jump down into the tunnel and head for the hideout? Inside, now, I say. You weren't supposed to wait for me. But she doesn't move. Instead, she stands in front of us with her fists clenched, her, clenched, her eyes flickering back and forth between me and June. I rush over and grab her hand, then pull her along with us to one of the small metal gratings that line where the alley's walls meet the ground. I can hear the first signs of patriots behind us. 
Please, I beg silently. Please let us be the first ones to reach the high out. They're coming, June says, her eyes fixed on a spot down the alley. Let them try to catch us. I run my hands frantically across the metal grating, then pry it open. The Patriots are getting closer. Too close. I stand up. Get out of the way, I say to Tess and June. Then I pull a second grenade from my belt, yank out the pin, and toss it toward the alleyway's opening. We throw ourselves to the ground and cover our heads with our hands. Boom. A deafening blast. It should slow the Patriots down some, but I can already see silhouettes coming through the debris and toward us. June runs to the open tunnel's entrance by my side. I let her jump in first, then turn to Tess and extend my hand. Come on, Tess, I say. We don't have much time. Tess looks at my open hand and takes a step back. In that instant, the world around us seems to freeze. She's not going to come with us. There's anger and shock and guilt and sadness, all wrapped up in her thin, tiny face. I try again. Come on, I shout. Please, Tess, I can't leave you here. Tess's eyes rip through me. I'm sorry, Day, she just gasps, but I can take care of myself, so don't try to come after me. Then she tears her eyes away from me and runs back toward the Patriots. She's rejoining them? I watch her go, stunned into silence, my hand still outstretched. The Patriots are so close now. Baxter's words. He'd warned Tess this whole time that I would betray them. I did. I did exactly what Baxter said I'd do. And now Tess has to live with it. I bled her down so bad. June's the one who saved me. Day, jump! She yells up at me, snapping me out of the moment. I forced myself to turn away from Tess and jump into the hole. My boots splash into shallow, icy water right as I hear the first Patriot reach us. June grabs my hand. Go! She hisses. We sprint down the black tunnel. Behind us, I hear someone else drop down and start running after us. Then another. They're all coming. Got any more grenades? June shouts as we run. I reach down to my belt. One. I pull the last grenade out and then toss the pin. If we use this, there's no going back. We could be stuck down here forever, but there's no other choice and June knows it. I shout a warning behind us and throw the grenade. The closest Patriot sees me do it and scrambles to a stop. Then he starts yelling at the others to get back. We keep sprinting. The blast lifts us clear off our feet and sends us flying. I hit the ground hard, skidding through icy water and slush for several seconds before coming to a stop. My head rings. I press my palms hard against my temples in an attempt to stop it. No luck, though. A headache bursts my mind wide open, drowning out all of my thoughts, and I squeeze my eyes shut at the blinding pain. One, two, three. Long seconds drag by. My head throbs with the impact of a thousand hammers. I struggle to breathe. Then, mercifully, it starts to fade. I open my eyes in the darkness. The ground has settled again. And even though I can still hear people talking behind us, they're muffled, as though it's coming from the other side of a thick door. Gingerly, I pull myself up into a sit sitting position. June's leaning against the side of the tunnel, rubbing her arm. We're both facing the space we come from. A hollow tunnel stood there just seconds ago. But now, a pile of concrete and rubble have completely sealed off the entrance. We've made it. But all I feel is emptiness. Not kill time, Sam. <laughs> so we'll keep going tomorrow because next was a long chapter and uh, see what happens next. So Tess just decided not to come with Day anymore. I don't think she trusts him anymore, which is really sad. June and Day have been reunited. June has betrayed the Patriots, and therefore Day has also betrayed the Patriots. So that's pretty crazy. All right, so um, I'm going to sign out. I'll be back tomorrow. If you have any questions about your projects or anything, I'm going to be on Zoom from 12 to 2. I'm going to eat some lunch real quick, or breakfast, lunch, whatever, whatever time it is. I'm going to eat some food um, real quick, and then uh, I'll be on zoom at noon. Okay. So if you need anything, I will talk to you then. All right. Bye.